growing up, my grandma always told me that the land took care of us and it still is taking care of us. And it never asks for anything back. Everything is connected and it's not humans and animals or humans and the nature around us, you know, we're all connected. And that acknowledgement is a way to acknowledge that we're coexisting in this land with the native people and we should acknowledge that this is actually their traditional territory. But at the same time, we are all guests to this land. The land plays a big factor in who we are. That's what makes us strong. That's what makes us strong people. Welcome, friends. I'm Barry Schiffman, director of the Banff International String Quartet Festival and Competition. And today's conversation as part of this BISC Festival um, is a special one because it deals with the concept of training the great string quartets that so many of you come and hear at our competition. And I'm extremely um, uh, lucky to be joined today by two of my dear friends and uh, two real experts in this, in this field of training. Um, uh, first of all, cellist Norman Fisher, um, who is joining us from, from quite a, uh, uh, a famous place in quartet legacy, which is Tanglewood. Um, I know in my own career, Norm, it had a huge impact. In fact, right after uh, being at the International String Quartet Competition in 1992, both the Ying Quartet and the St. Lawrence headed straight to Tanglewood and, uh, and worked with some of the great, the great masters. Um, in addition to being at Tanglewood, in the regular year, you're a professor of cello and you run an extraordinary uh, program of chamber music at the Shepherd School of Music at Rice University, uh, which happens to have um, trained a number of our laureates. Uh, so we feel quite close um, in that regard. Uh, so thank you, Norm, for, for joining us. Um, it's a great old... pleasure, Barry. Love it. Yeah. And, and you come to this training uh, quite naturally because you spent 16 years in one of the great quartets, the Concord Quartet. Um, so, um, uh, so we'll get to talking about that. My other dear friend on the call, Aaron Boyd. Aaron, thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Now, Aaron, um, like, like you, Norm, um, also comes from the world of the string quartet, um, having been in the magnificent Escher, uh, one of the great quartets and um, is now a professor of violin and director of chamber music um, at the Meadows School at Southern Methodist University. Um, and what's interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that you're able to, to, to spend time with us um, today, Aaron, what's interesting for us in this conversation is that the Meadows School um, began a partnership with the International String Quartet Competition in Banff prior to our last competition, um, connected to the, um, the kind of new model of, of string quartet and residence that, that you're doing at, at SMU. So there's lots to talk about, but I want to, um, I want to remember that the people that are watching uh, this show for the most part are members of our audience who come and love string quartet um, with a passion that is, is remarkable uh, yes. and are baffled as am I often at how four people can do what they do. And I've done it, but yeah. when I watch a great string quartet, it, it never ceases to, to amaze me that they're able to do this and how to train that special um, entity. Norm, um, you're probably working with a number of quartets currently at Tanglewood. What is that about? Well, you know, um, it usually, I mean, not, not pandemic times, but in the normal times um, at Tanglewood, we start with um, oh, eight, eight days of all the, all the upper strings and cellists are playing string quartets together. That's everybody's playing string quartets. And uh, I'm joined by members of the Juilliard Quartet and Andy Jennings, my violin colleague from the Concord days. And everybody does a Haydn Quartet and then something else from the standard repertoire. 
and uh, and then the violin switch. So this is incredibly intensive. They get coached every day, and so it's it is part of the absolute fabric of this. At the orientation at the beginning, I say, okay, so I put you into these groups that may seem ridiculous to you why you're in this particular group, but the point is you're not getting married. You you the point is that you have to, it is in your best interest to be supportive and create a network and a, and a, a whole energy about how you can support one another in a way that you can all be deeply vulnerable with one another. And when that happens, that a person's, um, let's say, uh, playing style, which when you listen to them, you sort of see this as a liability, can somehow become an asset in terms of what they're able to bring to their voice in, in an ensemble. Um, it, everybody is changing and developing in the course of this. And so also being provoked by two different coaches every day brings out uh, an enormous ability to be able to uh, transform in a very quick way. So it's the first thing, everybody's getting introduced to each other, large and small. We have master classes, everybody plays in a master class. And so it's, it's a kind of a magical alchemy at the beginning of the summer. And um, probably the most important thing is this ability to be able to deeply deeply listen and engage in a well, way that you can't you can't do in another environment right now you, you know the the um the origins of tanglewood was that it was the summer home of a symphony orchestra the boston symphony and um and the training program that began there was training young musicians many who would who would um join an orchestra but chamber music became a very big part of that training program and it's interesting that you talk about the vulnerability um, you talk about a number of things that we don't associate I don't personally associate with orchestra playing to the and yet that's an important part so does playing in a string quartet um, I mean I'm setting you up but does it make you better in an orchestra does it make you more vulnerable? Is that a bad thing? You know, you talked about listening. So in the string quartet, we don't have one of these, right? right. There's no production. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it, ironically, the person who pushed us into the string quartet seminar was Seiji Ozawa, <laughs> because uh, the, the conductor of the Boston Symphony, who understood that great quartet players were the kind of people that he wanted to have in the orchestra, because their capacity capacity to hear, capacity to feel, capacity to express themselves was so different than people who had been only trained in the orche orchestral realm. So he wanted to be able to surround himself with people that were interesting musicians. And so he teamed up a lot with Bobby Mann. And as you know, when he, he, had, he had Bobby every year in Japan. Uh, just for our listeners, Bobby Mann, of course, the for 51 years or 50 years, the first violinist of the famed Juilliard Quartet. Oh, yeah, and actually, even going back to the Tanglewood thing, my, my first violin, Mark Sokol from the Concord days, yes. attended the Juilliard Quartet's first bar talk cycle at Tanglewood wow. when he was a baby. But he, but he was there at the concert. 1947, wasn't it? 1947? 46, yeah. 46, 46. Yeah, yeah. And so it was uh, one of those historical moments. We felt that kind of legacy. But because of Eugene Lehner, who was a violist that was in the Kolisch Quartet in Vienna, and then came into the Boston Symphony as a violist, was the mentor to the Juilliard Quartet. So there are all these connections. So, um, and Piatigorsky was the first... Um, director of chamber music at Tanglewood. And so there's this huge legacy about how um, quartet playing, chamber music playing has been an integral part of Tanglewood. You know, also I would say probably if I were talking about Tanglewood is sort of a three pronged thing, it's orchestra, it's chamber music and it's contemporary music. Right. So everybody gets deeply enmeshed in all three of those things. 
Right. Now, Aaron, um, every quartet um, seems to come together and find each other in in different ways. Yeah. I, I know that through the, the, the work at Tanglewood, some people will meet in a quartet and maybe they'll, they'll try to, uh, to develop that, you know, after the summer program with, with the Escher quartet, how did you come together? How did you find each other? Oh, that's a story. Uh, I had, uh, I had been concertmaster in Arizona for a couple of seasons and I was enjoying that, but then I realized I did not want to uh, retire yet. And I came home to my wife one day and I said, you know, I, I said, I want to go back to New York. And she said, okay, let's go. And so we went back to New York and I, 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 I had assumed I would just stay on a kind of um, court, uh, concert master path. And uh, early, early on, when I returned to New York, our dear mutual friend, Masumi Rosted, yeah. he said, hey, I, you know, the Escher Quartet is, uh, I think he knew about them looking for a violinist. And I said, I wasn't interested. I'm doing the concert master thing. And he said, no, no, I think you should be interested. They're, you know, they're very good. And I didn't do anything about it. But then at Bridgehampton, the cellist, Dane Johansson, the cellist at the time, Jane Johansson invited me to audition. And I remembered what Masumi said. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And I went, played Opus 132 and I left for Moscow the next day. <laughs> yeah. And I played Opus 132 with them and I left for Moscow and they uh, emailed me when I was in Moscow. And I had one of my first long distance Skype calls and over about 10 years ago. And uh, they invited me to join. And it was uh, far scarier than I expected actually to commit to that, to that, to, to commit to a real group, not a group I'd put together for a project, not a group at school, but to commit to a real group with a real career, with a real season and real recording contracts. I remember that when we took photographs together for our, you know, the first publicity photos, I was, I was quite anxious about it all, uh, but we did it. I did. I was there for three, five seasons. You jumped onto a pretty fast moving train. Right? Yes. Yes. And, and we, we, they carried a lot of repertoire. So uh, I was learning all the time. And did they, the, the um, original members, did they meet in school or how, or did, was it a Tanglewood situation? They met at the Manhattan School of Music because the violinists and were there studying with Pinka Zuckerman. Okay. And, uh, and I believe the violist might have been as well. Um, I'm not quite sure, but they all met at the Manhattan School and okay. uh, had some personnel changes before, actually already before I had joined. Yeah. Now we were talking, you know, before before recording this call about this this um, interesting um, situation in in um, in America, uh, where um, I would say innovation in a pretty ancient art form um, is is pretty spectacular, and that. The, the concept of quartet training at a very high level in the university or uh, conservatory system through these um, faculty appointments, uh, quasi um, student, but um, artist diploma type of situation. So the, these quartet training programs that now are in many wonderful schools mm. and when we look back how that began, it's, it's an interesting connection to Europe because essentially the Nazi regime came in, chased a bunch of wonderful uh, European Jews out of Europe and they came to America, they were welcomed. Some of them welcomed by uh, the universities, I think of Madison. Yes. Uh, Pro Arte Quartet in Madison is a wonderful story because they were in the US on tour right. and then they, the Nazis had overrun Belgium, and suddenly uh, the chancellor just said, do you guys want to work here? We'll right. put together faculty positions for you. It was amazing. And, and, and thus became a quartet in residence at university. Yep. Uh, and there were a number of others. And then those quartets began to train and created what you are both involved in now in these quartet training residencies. So a, a, an actual group of four comes to either, um, you know, uh, either of your schools and and becomes better yeah. because of the training they receive. So um, they're quite different models and they're quite um, different ages. Um, the International String Quartet Competition in Banff um, has a partnership with Southern Methodist University, thanks to um, your introduction, Aaron. Um, 
where you run the, the peak fellowship program. And that, um, that is a, a particular model, right? Where a string quartet, one of the winners of the, of the competition because of our partnership visits multiple times at SMU. Yes. What do they do there? Well, before I answer that, I just want to say that you mentioned uh, the Jewish uh, diaspora of musicians, but there is one very important musician, uh, a non-Jew, who I talk about a lot, and that's the Adolf Busch, the great Adolf Busch. And Adolf Busch is, um, I've given lectures about his sacrifices, the her heroism of his sacrifice, and because as a non-Jew, he was promised anything he wanted. Uh, any, literally anything he wanted by the Nazi regime up to and including Adolf Hitler saying, you can have anything you want, basically. I'll give you any position you want, I'll create. And he walked away in 1933, not 1943, not 1939, but in 1933, when things just started, Adolf Busch walked away from the largest solo career in Europe and walked away from it all in solidarity with Jews. Yes. And he came, ended up coming here in the uh, early 40s with a broken heart, nursing a broken heart for what had happened in this country, what happened to European Jewry, and started the Marlboro Music Festival. And there, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's an inch of classical music, or at least an inch of classical chamber music in this country, which is not touched uh, by the influence and the heroism of Adolf Busch. So I think about Busch almost every day. A photograph of him is on my wall across from me right now, because we owe, in chamber music, owes almost everything to his uh, his influence. And so I would say that I've created nothing at at Meadows, but rather borrowed what I call the Marlboro model, uh, which I think is the greatest teaching model for chamber music. I I I came to Meadows with the the, the thinking that the, the model of sitting there with a score across the room from a quartet is useful, but it's old technology. I, I, didn't, I don't find that personally all that invigorating as a student or even as a teacher. I prefer to play alongside uh, students and I prefer for students to play alongside faculty and also students to play along, you know, in the case of the, the uh, winners of the Banff competition, the peak ensemble, they are, you know, junior senior types. Um, and to, for them to play alongside students, there's a whole range and hierarchy of, of playing experiences going on. I like that mix. I think it's uh, vibrant. It's challenging for everybody. Uh, and so that's, that's the model here at the Meadows School of the Arts, what I, just, I borrowed from, from the great Adolf Busch. Even though we were faced with uh, extraordinary challenges with this pandemic, Let's, yeah. let's not let's not let the pandemic color um, this conversation too much. But the idea with with the Peak Fellowship and Banff was that our laureates would visit SMU multiple times over the yes. over the two years. Yes, and they did a number of things. Right? They first of all they rehearsed because every great string quartet that's young needs to rehearse, and they they want desperately. So yes. found them a house. They rehearsed. That's and they did yes. that that Marlboro model where they sat side by side with some of the more junior students in the, at, 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 at yeah. SMU, and they performed repertoire. Yes, and but they also, they also performed along, I invited uh, violist Paul Neubauer to come and to work with them. So they performed alongside Paul Neubauer as well. And so they're getting it from both sides, essentially. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, we're going to, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to be able to hear uh, some of this and um, because you capture some wonderful video of the work that, uh, the Viano Quartet did when they were at um, at SMU. Yes. Um, let's take a listen now. Actually, um, you, you've given us this wonderful video. This is a um, a performance of uh, an octet, or is it nonet? A, nonet. Sorry, by Oli Mustonen, who's a wonderful composer and extraordinary pianist. Yes. Uh, so the Viano Quartet came, and then what were the other instruments that joined them for this? Well, it's a double string quartet with double bass. Uh, and so students, these were a, PD, a performance de degree students, master's degree students, and uh, they were thrown into the, the <laughs> they were just thrown into the, the mix along with the, they all had to learn it very quickly. It was a new work for all of them, which I thought was a very nice uh, touch. It was completely new to all of them. Great. Okay, well, let's take a listen.
Well, Aaron, we can see that that absolutely is uh, invigorating. It's a great piece of music, first of all, and uh, it's fun to see the the vitality of of those uh, you know energized vianos That's side by side with the the younger players. It's it's great. Um, Norman at uh, at the Meadow School, it's a different type of model. Um, you have a great chamber music program, but then you have a specialized thing where a string quartet comes and rather than visits multiple times, like the Viano, they come and they spend two years, isn't it, with, with, with you? Yeah, at the Shepherd School, yeah. Yeah, and there that the, um, sorry, at the Shepherd School, yeah, right. So there, um, the Dover Quartet, the Rolston Quartet. Yeah. Um, there's no shortage of, of uh, the Callisto Quartet are just finishing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we'll hear the Callisto uh, in a little bit, but tell us a bit about what a string quartet does over those two years um, at Rice. Well, you know, um, it sort of starts with the audition in a way, as a lot of these things do, where not only they play and we get a sense about what they're about on stage, but then conversations with them are also very interesting about how much they've thought about uh, about a life as a string quartet player and how much they know about life as a string quartet player. And so a lot of this is um, uh, where we probe and sort of say, okay, so what is your five-year, 10-year, 15-year idea about what you would like to do with your life as a quartet? And many of them haven't, many of them haven't really thought about it. They're just, they just want to be good and they want to have the joys of playing this. You sort of say who does the travel, who does the banking, who does the, you know, this sort of stuff. And again, if they've not that experience. So this gives us an idea about how ready they are, both uh, in terms of preparing themselves for a career and also uh, what they know about it. So you know what you know what you're getting into, essentially. Yeah. But then, but then that is also part of what, what happens when when they're living there and are mentored in all these ways. And as, as, you know, as Aaron was pointing out, there's so much to be learned by just being in proximity um, with, with, the, with people that have been there before. So uh, almost everybody on the string faculty at Rice has been in a professional quartet. Uh, and so they're surrounded in a way by all, the, all their the, the coaches and mentors, the people that we have, they're basically three principal people that are involved in the program, which uh, myself, I was in the Concord Quartet. James Dunham was in the Sequoia and Cleveland Street Quartet as violas. And uh, we had Ken Goldsmith for many years until sadly his, his death um, last year. And, and, uh, and now uh, Evo van der Werf, who is a violist and was in the Medici Quartet for over 25 years in England, um, is also working with them. So they will coach with uh, each of us every week. And, and so as you would expect, just like when listening to a string quartet master class, we don't always agree. And then it's fun for, fun for the quartet to be gathering that stuff. But there's lots of opportunity also to talk about how do you think about this? What are the ways in which you make decisions, how do you look at the score? How do you think about the culture? Mm -hmm. How do you think about the audience you're playing for, uh, et cetera? You know, so it's a lot, lot, lots of probing aspects to that. Yeah, we're going to hear during this festival, a wonderful performance that uh, was, was created. Thank you for your help on that, by the way, uh, from your school with the Callisto Quartet, who are prize winners in our last competition. And they're joined by um, Canadian cellist Desmond Hubig, who was in the Orford Quartet, is on your faculty in the Great Schubert Quartet. So we're going to see that Callisto Quartet really um, in, in pretty much their last week um, at, at your school. Um, but you've also um, uh, shared some video, which, which we're going to show now, which is um, a performance by the Young Rolston Quartet um, before they um, uh, were at the competition, I think. 
Right. Uh, yeah. This, um, in, in a uh, performance of Mozart, it, it's three eighty seven, isn't it? I think. Exactly. Yeah. This was in their in their very first recital after they arrived. And um, and what I love about this uh, video is uh, it shows um, the work that they did on classical style with Ken Goldsmith, who was one of the very early uh, people involved in, in, um, in early music in America. And, and he was educated at, I think at Stanford, you know, with the uh, with all these people and, and, but more than just being an academic, it was mostly about this, there are certain rules, but after a while, then you just make music. And, um, and so uh, you'll hear in the video uh, uh, how they will not use a lot of vibrato and the very clear sounds and an affect about the phrasing and certain kinds of things, it's but you know, it's very different than the um, than the, the than the caricature that some people like to refer to of the American school, which yeah. which I think is first of all I don't know what the American school is as we've already referenced a lot of it came from from people that came from Europe, um, but uh, there is maybe a New York tradition which is which is a lot of vibrato and quite you know strong, and the Rolston Quartet um, they had a I hate to, it, it, it sounds wrong, but they had a more European aesthetic to their sound. It was a more transparent sound, which it sounds like they have developed with uh, with Ken, which is lovely. But, and, and it was, uh, the, in, the principal thing that you hear is not the style, but the joy. The joy, the yeah. You know, well, let's take, a listen. let's take a listen. Here's the Rolston Quartet uh, from several years ago when they were in, in residence at the Shepherd School of Music at Rice performing Mozart.
Well, that was great to hear, Norm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we definitely heard that transparency, that lack of a broado, and 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 like you referenced earlier, a real joy, uh, joy in, in music making. Um, in my uh, in my own professional life, um, the St. Lawrence Quartet began uh, in Toronto in a residency that was sort of cobbled together for us by our dear friend Dennis Brott, um, and. Uh, he also was inspired by that uh, Marlboro model, um, having gone to Marlboro. And so one of the things that we did in that first year of that residency was that there was a concert series that he put together for the quartet. And each concert involved a collaborative work with a really great collaborator who we were all in awe of. So um, our first performance ever of Schumann Piano Quintet was with Anton Querti, the great Canadian piano. And so we were just, you know, our first performance of Mozart G minor viola quintet was with Jamie Laredo. <laughs> um, and Mozart clarinet quintet was with James Campbell. And so you can't, um, you can't overestimate or, you know, exaggerate how much you learn just making music with somebody really experienced and inspired beside you. Um, and from there, the St. Lawrence Quartet um, went to the U.S. because there were a number of wonderful opportunities there. And the, the Emerson Quartet were launching their first quartet residency training program at heart. So we moved to New York to study with them. And, and, uh, and then we just went from, there were so many opportunities. We were two years with the Emerson. We went and spent two years with the extraordinary Juilliard Quartet at the Juilliard School. And we did another residency at... Yale University with the wonderful Tokyo. So we were really lucky in that there was an explosion of these opportunities and, and we took full advantage of them um, because we needed that time to, uh, to find our voice. I think that's, it's about finding your voice in the end. Um, if I have a regret about my uh, four years at Juilliard, when I think of the faculty who were there at the time, uh, Robert Mann, so Robert Mann, Joel Smirnoff, Samuel Rhodes, Joel Krosnick, Harvey Shapiro, uh, Felix Gallimere, uh, uh, the wonderful pianist uh, who was uh, the friend of Bartok, uh, Georgi Shandor. So the list goes on and on and on. And the, the system there did not ever, it never existed that faculty played with students. So I, I shudder to think what it would have been like if I'd had an opportunity to play a Mozart viola quintet with, with Bobby Mann, or a cello quintet with Harvey Shapiro, or Bartok, anything with Gheorghe Shandor, or Schoenberg with Felix Gallimir. This It wasn't set up that way. Things weren't done that way, certainly not at scale anyway. And so part of what, what I'm doing now, uh, you know, I'm hearing you describe all these amazing experiences, Barry. What I'm trying to make happen at SMU is what I wasn't, wasn't lucky enough to experience myself uh, when I was that age. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we've discussed this and that's why we were excited to partner. I think the model you have is really great. And um, and uh, the funding, of course, that you've been able to secure is, is extraordinary. Um, there's a level of funding in some of these residency programs in the U.S. that, um, you know, uh, talking to you from Canada um, and, and working at a great school, at the Gun Gould School, I still am in awe in, uh, as to some of the extraordinary resources for chamber music in some of the big U.S. schools. Um, so, um, I think, I think that model is great, that, that side-by-side -side model, um, and the Banff Center, um, outside of the string quartet competition, as, as you both know, has decades long history of training young emerging artists in, in chamber music. And my goodness, I, I remember so many opportunities as a young person in Banff, um, with some of those names that you that you just yes, read, yes. That were, you know wonderful yeah. uh, well look it's it's um it's been an extraordinary year um year and a half for all of us um, still is barry still is we're not out of this yet no we are not out of it but i know firsthand how incredibly engaged you both were in keeping um keeping everything going to the absolute best of your ability and and both of your schools I think were were remarkable I know in my own work at the Glenn Gould School um, you know we did everything we could to keep the kids the kids the young artists playing yes um, and 
and now we will see the results of that because I don't know what you're seeing at Tanglewood, but the musicians I'm I'm in touch with, the young musicians, all they want now mm-hmm. is to get together and make music. Well, they are, right. you know, they're desperate for that. So, the, so I think the, it, the very first orchestra concert here, you know, I mean, the audience, the the musicians, everybody was so thrilled, and the first Boston Symphony concert. Mm-hmm. First, the first concert that they did with an audience. I mean, so everybody was in this incredible euphoria. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. 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 So let's hope that there is this euphoria. I think there, I think, I think it will continue. And, and, uh, and we have, you know, I think quite a positive wave of euphoria to, to ride. I think so. You know, it'll, it'll take a while till, till, till we are back fully. Um, the International String Quartet Competition is in, uh, 2022, um, end of the summer, uh, early September. So uh, my expectation is that um, we'll have lots of extraordinary groups and our audience will be back. We announced um, just today the, the rules repertoire, uh, mm-hmm. rules regulations of repertoire. And, uh, and as always, there are lots of tweaks. Um, yeah. And as always, there are lots of hiding. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> um, you, you, both of you, I, I, you have my my uh, most sincere thanks for your time today and for all you're doing to keep the flames alive and to keep that next generation of young quartets having a place to go and to train. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's such a thrill. Thanks, Norm. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs>